In Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 34, the entire passage, we read of Paul's famous speech in Athens at Mars Hill. This was significant because it was his first and most direct contact with the elite philosophers and teachers of his day. The most important showcase of Christian ideas and the gospel message to the pagan mind concentrated in a single location. The Areopagus was the Supreme Council of Athens on the Upper Council, as it was called. These were the great and the famous of Athens who were elected to this office for life. And they were gathered to hear this new idea, this new teaching, as befitting the rich and powerful who are in every generation the first to come in contact with new ideas and groundbreaking thoughts. Of course, we're familiar with Paul's sermon on the topic of the unknown God, where the apostle used an inscription on one of Athens' many pagan altars dedicated to an unknown deity as the basis for his lesson on the true and the very knowable God. And so as these distinguished politicians and thinkers and artists and leaders listen to Paul's description of the God who created all things, including mankind, the God who could not be divined by human will or human art, the God who would exercise a judgment one day, a God who had intervened in human history by resurrecting a certain man from the dead, as they listened and they compared the identity of this God with the gods that they knew, they were challenged to consider a truly new idea, one that for all their pompous boasting about being open and curious about what was new, they were not ready for. Paul introduced them to a God that required a personal change from them a God that was the arbitrator of what was true and right and just and demanded that they conform to His will or else. A God that couldn't be bribed, a God that couldn't be manipulated or scripted or used, but rather was the one who did the scripting, was the one that did the demanding, the rewarding and the punishing. This is the God that He was beginning to reveal to this group. And so they found a convenient place to challenge Paul's teaching. The resurrection of a person from the dead was an easy point to scorn. To scoff at human resurrection was a convenient way to save face and to dismiss their guest. It was also a panicky reaction to an idea so powerful that it could um, engulf them and change their world beyond recognition if they would have accepted it. You see, smart men have always searched for new and better ways to change the world, but invariably they seek out methods that do not include God. This was true then and it has been consistently through, throughout history, even into modern times. Let me give you several examples of smart people who wanted to change the world without God and how they succeeded. The first of these is Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche was a poet and philosopher who lived in the 19th century. He was a complete atheist who believed that the concept of the dignity of individual life and equality of men only diluted the entire society. His method of creating a good world without God was to allow the superior intellectual and physical specimens of humanity in society to allow these people to rise to power. These supermen, as he called them, would then be able to create a better society from the best to the least. Sort of a top-down management style of changing the world. His theories and ideas are often referred to as nihilism. Another smart man who tried to change the world without God was Karl Marx. 
Karl Marx was an economist and philosopher who lived much of his life in England in the 19th century. He also was an atheist, but he believed quite the opposite of Nietzsche. He believed that the way to make society good without God was to make everybody equal. And the way to make everyone equal was when the lower working class, what he called the proletariat, overthrew the upper classes, and this was to be done by revolution. Revolution was the way to make everyone equal, and when everyone was equal, there would be justice and there would be a good society without God. Kind of a bottom-up management style. And then the third person that I want to mention this morning is Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was an Austrian psychiatrist and founder of psychoanalysis who died in 1939. He also rejected belief in God as a childish illusion and he taught that transformation of society begins with the understanding that humans can change themselves for the better. Science could unlock the mysteries of the mind and correct behavior so that it would become acceptable. And this could be done through his program of therapy, which was in a sense a kind of ongoing transformation process for the individual a kind of an outside-in change to make the world better without God. Now these men and many other men and women like them envisioned a change in the world without God. And to an extent they succeeded. Nietzsche's ideology was wrestled away by the Nazis and with Hitler in command, Germany managed to control most of Europe and nearly dominated the world in his lifetime, all to create this super race. And Karl Marx fostered a movement called communism, which managed to suppress religious expression in nearly 70% of the world's population for almost a half century. And Sigmund Freud's ideas have helped mold a society, especially in the West, that is saturated with sexual content and completely self-centered and godless with self-gratification at the center of existence, his was a great influence. And yet, with all of this influence, I want you to look at the final results of these efforts to change the world without God. Nietzsche's legacy left Hitler defeated, Germany destroyed, millions dead, and his ideology completely repudiated except for extreme fanatics in places like South Africa for a time. Karl Marx's socialist paradise turned into a nightmare as country after country in Europe totally rejected the, com the communist cause and turned to democratic reforms in order to counter the huge problems that 50 years of communism produced. And Freud's exhortation to exchange faith in God for faith in self has given us a society that worships technology, glorifies sex, and cannot conceive of a God any greater than man himself, which is small comfort in this dark and dangerous world. Now, I mention all of this because several years ago, all of these ideas came into focus for me personally while I was listening to a newscast one morning on my way to work. I was working in Montreal in those days. And the local newscast, never mind international news, the local newscast, the, fair, the first three items on the local newscast that I was listening to as I was driving to my office were the following. 14 women were murdered last night by a gunman at the University of Montreal. The worst killing spree in Canadian history. Second news story. An eight and a half month old baby was murdered by her parents, who also abused the two and a half year old sister as well. Third news item, remember local news. 3,200 children were awaiting appointments with social workers as a result of accusations of child abuse in the home. Remember, this was just in my own city. And so the reality of this newscast brought home to me one important point. Despite the efforts of these men and others like them, our attempt to change the world without God have failed miserably. 
These men have failed miserably because the world is not better. In fact, the world without God only gets worse. Now, as you know, I'm certainly not a philosopher or a poet or a scientist. I'm a preacher. But I propose that in order to change the world, we must make known to the world the God that has been and continues to be unknown by most of this world. And in our declaration to the philosophers and thinkers and leaders and those who think that they can change this world, we must declare to these people the following. First of all, we must declare that God is the Lord of creation, not man. The psalmist tells us why we should do this. First of all, because God is the creator of the world and He wants to be recognized as the creator of the world. In Psalm 33 verses 10 to 12, excuse me, verses six to nine rather, he says the following, by the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe before Him. God wants the creation to know that only He is God. Also, because the greatness of a nation depends on its trust in God, not in its ideologies or political systems or its military might. And we continue in Psalm 33, this time in verse 10. The psalmist says, the Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of His heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom He has chosen for His own inheritance. It is God, the creator of the world and nations, that exalts a nation, not man. It is God, the creator of the world, who destroys nations, and happy are the people who recognize this fact, not only in church, but in the philosophical and political arena as well. If we want to change the world, we have to recognize who created it and who has the power to change it. Not man, God. If we want to change the world, we must also declare that sinfulness is the root of mankind's problems. You know, Paul formalizes this idea in Romans 6.23 when he writes, the wages of sin is death, but this is the larger truth that everyone wants to ignore. It began with the disobedience of Adam, which set into motion the destruction of the ecology, as well as the weakening of our human nature to the point that we are subject to both physical and spiritual death. Sin is the problem. Sins of pride provoke wars in homes as well as in nations. Sins of greed provoke poverty and violence. Sins of lust provoke chaos in every society. Sins of dishonesty provoke confusion and loss. If we want to change the world, we have to tell the world what's really wrong with itself. Sinfulness destroys the world, not ignorance and poverty. Ignorance and poverty and violence are the product of sin, not the other way around. We have to declare this truth over and over again. We are witnesses of this truth. Amen. And then finally, if we want to change the world, we must declare that the change begins and it ends with Jesus Christ. We need to understand that systems and ideologies and revolutions will never change people for good. Only Christ can change a person for eternity and thus make a radical change in and of this world. You know, it's interesting to note that Western nations enthusiastically encourage former communist and terrorist nations to embrace democratic and capitalistic solutions. All we want for the Middle East is for them to adopt democracy and to go into a capitalistic system. Everything will be okay. 
And they say that once this is done, some kind of magic transformation will take place. All will become peace and prosperity and the transformation of the world will take place. And of course, this is utter nonsense. The West is offering the East the chance to worship at the altar of mammon because it believes that society can be transformed if it is prosperous enough, the gospel of prosperity. If the Middle Eastern countries are prosperous enough, there'll be no war, there'll be no problems. And the way to do this is by promoting and practicing the free market system. Why do you think devout Muslims reject this idea? They, as well as we who follow Christ, know that social democracy and the capitalistic system has not solved the real problems in this country any more than communism solved the problems of Eastern Europe or fundamentalist Islam solves the problems in the Middle East. Our system has simply given us more freedom, more freedom to do what's right, but also more freedom to do what's wrong. The only person that can truly affect a change in our world is not the US president or the UN or even a safe and free Middle East. The only person who can make a change, a true change, is Jesus Christ. Until He changes us, until He changes what is going on in the world, it is and it will always be more of the same. Have you not noticed? I've been reading the newspaper from cover to cover since I was 14 years old. Every day I read the newspaper. I've read it in, you know, in Canada, different cities in Canada. I've read it in different cities. I, I not only read the local paper, I read the, the international news, I listen to you know, the BBC, I, I like news, I like to know what's going on, and you know what? It's always the same. It never changes. One war after another, it doesn't, you know, one thing dies down, another thing blows up. But we keep trying the same man-made solutions. At least we as Christians ought to know, ought to propose the idea that Jesus is the one that can make a change. Of course, what I've given you here are the broad declarations that we need to make when we have a chance, as Paul made when he had a prime audience on Mars Hill in Athens. And if they would have listened, if they would not have cut him off when they did, what do you think he would have said? Have you ever thought about that? What was the rest of the sermon? What was the rest of the lesson? What would that have been if they would not have said, okay, enough, stop, we'll listen to you some other day. What would he have said? Well, he declared the sovereignty of God, the need for men to repent, the coming of judgment, and the way of salvation through a resurrected Christ. If they would have let him continue in Athens, perhaps he would have explained to them what he explained to another Greek audience in Corinth, and that is, how Jesus changes people and thus changes the world. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to go to 1 Corinthians, please, chapter six. We'll take a look at a passage there. If Paul would have continued preaching, I'm persuaded that the content of his lesson would have been the following. 1 Corinthians, chapter six, Verses 9 to 11, Paul explains the process of change. And he says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, shall inherit the kingdom of God. That would have been a pretty good opening line for the people on Mars Hill. They would have recognized themselves in that description. What does he do here? He describes accurately the state of our society, even though this was written 2,000 years ago. Isn't this the state of our society? Aren't these sins the common sins of today? And then if you just read a little further in verse uh, 11. Note what he says. And such were some of you, 
but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Note he doesn't mention science here. He doesn't talk about social reform as the agent of change because these things find their source in people. And the sad reflection of 6,000 years of recorded human history has taught us that one thing, people cannot change themselves. Paul reveals the key to change not only for the one person, but for entire societies. We are changed by God. We cannot change ourselves. We can make adjustments, but we can't make change. In these verses, Paul explains how God changes us through Jesus Christ, a step-by-step -step process. First of all, he says, he washes us clean from sin. God goes to the root of the problem in human nature. He confronts sin. He pays the penalty of death for it on the cross with His Son, and then He offers forgiveness in order to wash our consciences clean of guilt. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when the people said to Peter, men and brethren, what should we do? And what does he answer? Well, we're going to start a social program, and then we're going to appoint a committee and then we want everyone to fill out some you know, questionnaires. Is that what he said? No, he said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, because the problem was sin. And that's how God deals with sin, not with committees. And then in 1 Peter 3, verse 21, Peter talks about uh, baptism being an appeal to God for a good conscience. Isn't that what people need to make a change? Isn't that the thing that drives shame? Isn't that the thing that drives fear and dread and makes us do all kinds of things? A heavy conscience, a memory of things we've done, the fear that we can't stop doing the bad things we don't want to do. Isn't that the problem? at the core level, and what does Peter say? He says, baptism is what? It's an appeal to God for a clear conscience, a clean conscience. The root of the problem is there. A clean conscience brings joy, brings peace. That's a real change. When you have a clear conscience, you're ready for change because you're not weighted down anymore with the things that cause the sorrow in your life. And then he says, you were sanctified. Sanctified means to set apart. A group of people are there, for example, and God chooses a certain group and He sets them apart for a special purpose, like the priests in the Old Testament. Among the Jews, He selected a group and He set them apart for a special service. Sanctification. And sanctification, is like a new identity. Before we belong to the world, we're sinners, we're unclean, we're unworthy, we're condemned. But when Christ washes us clean, we take on a new identity, a changed identity. These new people are called saints, Christians, believers, the church, the sanctified, many names for them. Christ doesn't just change the existing society, he creates a new society that will ultimately survive this old society. That's why they're washed. That's why they're set apart. Why do you think we are set apart? What do you think we are set apart for? We're set apart to succeed this society. This society will end, but the society that Jesus creates will go on. And then thirdly, he says, he justifies us. He justifies us. Washing relieves the conscience for past sins. We have peace for things that we cannot atone for, nor can we change, but we have peace. Sanctification gives us a new identity, a new place into which we fit now. This new identity gives us our sense of value and purpose as a people of God. I am somebody new. You know, when I was 50 years old, my mother uh, 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 informed me that my father was not actually my father. I mean, it may have happened to some of you, but I was 50 before I found that out. 
And I want to tell you, that really shook me. I'm thinking, well, you know, my dad died when, he was, when I was 15, so you know, I couldn't go back to him and say, well, dad, well, you know, what's the story? What happened here? Imagine, 50 years old, I began to think, wow, man, I, here I am thinking I'm Italian. <laughs> Where's the love of pasta come from? So all of a sudden, you know, I don't have any desire to look up my genealogical records. Why? I don't belong to that group. And by the time that my mother would want to talk about it, she had Alzheimer's. She couldn't remember. She couldn't remember. Many conversations we had. Imagine you say to your mother, well, mom, who am I really? And she says, I, I can't remember. And the saving moment for me was the realization that, well, I'm not Italian. I'm not Canadian. I'm not American by adoption. I'm a Christian. That's my identity. You can't imagine how much comfort that gave me at that moment to know that I'm really someone and I belong somewhere, even, even if in the past, the social things, the human things got all mixed up and you know, the world, it's, it was the world. God gives us a new identity that supersedes every other identity and connection that, that we have. And then he says, he justifies us. Justification means that God no longer condemns us for sin. He no longer holds our weaknesses and our sinfulness against us. We hold it against us. Have you ever said that to yourself? You're doing something, you say something, and in your mind you're saying, stupid, 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 there you go again, shooting off your big mouth. Thank God that that voice does not belong to God. That voice belongs to me. Because God never says that to me. Jesus never says that to me. Why? because I have been justified for the wrongs that I do and the weak man that I am once and for all. It's done. And so justification gives us confidence for the future because we will fail and we will sin again and we will come to recognize our imperfections to a greater degree in Christ and this is so painful. However, because we are justified by faith in Christ, we have the assurance that we will uh, we've fulfilled all of God's requirements in order to be just and saved forever. We were talking in class before about the song, Jesus paid it all. And the key word there is not paid, the key word there is all. So that thing that I'm saying to myself, stupid, stupid, stu that's been paid for. In Jesus Christ, our past is forgotten, our present is renewed and our future is assured. In this world of same old, same old and more of the same, this represents a true and lasting and satisfying change. Have you ever watched the news and seen the injustice, the killing, the famine, the poverty in the world and felt absolutely helpless to do anything to change it for the better? You know, you don't have to feel helpless. You can begin to make the unknown God known and change the world. We can't save the world. That's not our task. The world will be destroyed and everything in it. But we can make a change for the better for the time that we are here. And it begins with you accepting God as the ruler of your world. In other words, the part of the world that you control. Your car, you control that. Your home, your business, your goods, your work, your family. When you let God control this part of the world, it's the beginning of His control of the entire world. Secondly, it continues with a sincere acknowledgement that you contribute to the mess out there with your sins. I could put our sins. It's our sins that bring misery to the world. You don't, you don't believe that? 
That $2 latte that you have uh, at Starbucks, you're drinking that $2 latte because a little boy who's nine years old is picking coffee beans for a dollar a day somewhere and living in a shack. So let's not, let's not just you know, look at other countries and blame other countries. We contribute to the mess in this world, collectively and individually, and we need to own up to that. It's our sins that sent Jesus to the cross. It's our sins that will ultimately condemn us. There's never any change without an acknowledgement of personal responsibility. You want to change, you have to acknowledge that you're contributing part of the problem. And then finally, the change in you is completed when you realize that as a sinner, you need God and His forgiveness more than you need anything else. This need moves you to confess your faith in Christ. Confirm this by repentance and baptism. You know, we were talking about, again, this idea in class and someone said to me, well, what about somebody who you know, doesn't, refuses to be baptized, doesn't want to be baptized, what about that person? And I'm, I'm, you know, I gave them an answer that we usually give, well, you know, let God judge, uh, go to the Word. You know. But I realize that the person who says, why should I be baptized? Uh, really, should I win? Well, I'll put it off. They're saying that because you know what? They don't need God that much. Because if you really need God, if you really, really recognize what you really are in front of God, and the only thing He says to you is come to me through the waters of baptism, you will not hedge about that. putting off confessing Christ even though you intellectually know the truth about it. Why? People always say, why don't people just do it? Because they don't need it enough. They don't need Him enough. Baptism becomes the historical context where the transforming change is completed as you arise from the watery grave, washed, sanctified, justified. I believe Paul might have told these great men, these world-changing thinkers, that the world has changed one person at a time. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that, what's that word? Whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life, John 3, 16. We've said it before, that word whosoever in the Greek means everyone, but it means everyone one at a time. Each person here today can actually begin to change the world if you're willing to let God change you first. It's in this way that we, in our generation, will make the unknown God known to a lost and dying world. If you need to begin that change, if you need to start that process, Begin it today, you can come forward, you can talk to one of the elders, you can speak to one of the ministers. Take the step, make the change, recognize that you need God desperately this day.